<laughs> All right. Hopefully this is working. The eternal question. <laughs> the eternal question. Yeah, I, I, I sort of have to go to like sort of like a Schrodinger question. Like, are will some external source view us and can collapse the wave function and know that we actually exist? If a if two it's in the forest and no one sees did it really happen anyway. <laughs> but but people say they were live hopefully they, yes 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 <laughs> I, if you run the calculations the answer is yes yes um yeah yeah uh all right well we did it so who are you what do you do so i'm jillian scudder i am an assistant professor at overland college i teach physics and astronomy um and i also write about space a lot uh, so, uh, those are the two main things I do in, in life these days. Yeah. Um, I teach, I teach people about space and then I write about space to hopefully teach people about space. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get, let's first set up your credentials. So, uh, what specifically was your PhD in? what are you trained to do? And my PhD was in understanding the physics of galaxy collisions. Um, and what changes that can produce in a galaxy, the number of stars the galaxy forms, and also in how we see the chemical composition of that galaxy. Um, and so because you have two galaxies coming at each other, you get very weird tidal effects gravitationally that a galaxy does not normally have. Um, and that basically jostles the galaxy. And so, um, Collisions, merger events between galaxies are a really fun way to figure out what happens if you sort of shake the galaxy and figure out like, yeah. okay, well, if we etch a sketch this a little bit, what yeah. happens? Um, and things go falling around and you know, we get gas that falls towards the center and then it causes a starburst and the gas is moving around so we can see that chemically changing things. Um, so yeah, I spent, I spent three five years doing that <laughs> yeah yeah um now was that pre-gaia or post this is gaia? definitely pre-gaia yeah okay um so i was not actually looking at the milky way at all i was looking at external galaxies so this was using the sloan digital sky survey um and because i wanted both the, the chemical composition and the star formation rates I wound up with actually quite a small number of galaxies, even though Sloan Digital Sky Survey has something like 928,000 galaxies in, in the uh, sample. But that because sound I like needed. A lot. <laughs> well, it's a lot. It's the nearby universe, right? Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> you don't get to go forever. Um, so, but by the time the chemical, getting the chemical data is much harder to do than yeah. just getting the star formation rate. So, by the time I was done, I had a sample of almost 1900 galaxies wow. i had one 1899 and i was really annoyed that there was not one more <laughs> <laughs> or 101 more i i think yeah. that's 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 enough that's a that's a very comprehensive survey of of colliding galaxies and what yeah. did you, what did you discover we discovered that galaxies are impacted by a merging event for a lot longer than we thought they were. Hmm. Um, so prior to my PhD work, we had this sort of notion that galaxies were coming in, they'd have this strong gravitational perturbation, which would maybe um, distress the galaxy very temporarily. And then they would separate widely from each other and um, go back to normal pretty quickly. And then at some point they would fall back together and some of them will coalesce into a single object. And so when I was doing my work, we found out that we were seeing galaxies that had really strong star formation very far away from each other, which meant that they had already passed close to each other mm -hmm. and had the time to separate again. And we're still feeling the impacts of that interaction, that gravitational jostle. And so they might then decline and go back to sort of normal as they come back in, but then they're, they'll sort of blend with other galaxies that are in the final stages where they're feeling really strong gravitational forces. So that was the really brand new thing that mm -hmm. we learned was that this was a really long-term process. The galaxy can feel this effect for a long time. I mean, the thing that I think has been fairly interesting recently, and this is sort of back to Gaia, is that a yeah. lot of astronomers have, have tracked 
these kinds of events as they relate to the Milky Way. Mm-hmm. Even even rolling back the Milky Way's history, seeing recent meals, figuring out the building blocks that came together to form the Milky Way and the repercussions of our most recent impact, which I think was like 8 billion years ago. And yet the Milky Way is still, you could still make out the digested material of the last meal that the Milky we have a very so unfair advantage with the Milky Way, which is that we can see it in extremely high resolution. Uh, if you put the Milky Way at any distance away, we would really struggle to see these signs of old mm. interactions. But because we can track individual stars in the Milky Way and be like, hey, there's this little like warp thing or this little streamer of, ga- of stars that shouldn't be there when we can do this really detailed like oh look there used to be a dwarf galaxy and that one used to be a dwarf galaxy <laughs> and yeah. the whole the whole get disc is kind of wonky at the edges so like hmm all right yeah stuff has happened to our galaxy but from any larger distance we wouldn't be able to do that so it's kind of a fun thing with our galaxy like on the one hand we can trace really detailed events that happened a long time ago but on the other hand we don't know what it looks like from the outside (laughs) so yeah yeah now now i mean james webb has got a bunch of jobs to do but but one of the biggest jobs one of its main pretty much its main purpose is to do exactly what you need Mm -hmm. right like to look back to the very beginning of the universe and see the first galaxies the building blocks of galaxies coming together how long did it take? Did it happen quickly? Did it happen slowly? What what were they composed of? Were they fully mature galaxies? Were they dwarf galaxies? Have you been doing some thinking about about what you would look for in the James Webb data? Um, I haven't really because there's so much. The stuff that I've been working on now has been again very local, and so we're I'm I've been switching from sort of holistic views of nearby galaxies to very detailed views of nearby galaxies because I'm working with um, the new Sloan data, which is an integral field spectrograph. So instead of one spectrum from the center of the galaxy, you have somewhere between 100 and 2000 spectra from across the galaxy. And so there's all sorts of stuff that you can do with that like quasi resolved information about the galaxy that we've never been able to do before. So sorry, I I want to talk about that more, but I just want to stop you for one second there. So like I remember the the Sloan Sky Survey, they had like one fiber optic cable that matched up each individual galaxy in these metal plates that they would put in front of their telescope and then they would only let that little bit of light. So you're saying they've now changed it so that now it can do samples from across the galaxy? Yeah, so what they've got is still got the metal plate, but they've drilled a slightly bigger hole and into the hole, instead of feeding one fiber optic cable, they feed a bundle of fiber optic cables. Um, And so you get this hexagonal pack of somewhere between um, 17 and 127 um, things. And they're tiny. The whole bundle is like still you, there's an image of it, of the fiber bundle in one of the papers and you can see someone's thumb in it and it just looks enormous. Like, oh, right. The tiny but, thing. But they all uh, correspond to pixels and they allow you to then measure yeah. the ske- spectroscopic data of the galaxy's parts. Yes. That's yeah. amazing. So then you, you, you can dither it a little bit and so you get more information and so then you can sort of subdivide. Um, But yeah, it's been really cool. So the old Sloan data, you got one piece of data from the center of the galaxy and that was it. And if it wasn't in there, that's not where your spectrum was. So tough luck. (laughs) And now we've got, you know, the center, but then also all the way out to a good number of these, it's nearby galaxies and they're all face on. So you're just getting the whole disk of the galaxy. And so you're starting to be able to say, well, okay, but Do these relationships that we built up for nuclear spectra in a galaxy, do they still hold Mm -hmm. in the outer regions of a galaxy and at smaller spatial scales? Um, So it's been really fun. The data volume is delightfully large. (laughs) Right. Uh, (laughs) Right. So I mentioned at the start that the the old data, the data I was working with with uh, my PhD was 900,000 galaxies. Um, The second to last data release of the new this DR, it's the dr15 instead of the dr7 but the new second to last data release of the current sloan iteration had nine million 
Mm-hmm. Uh, now we're talking. Yeah. Yeah. And they've just released the the final data release, which more than doubled the sample. So we're probably looking at like eighteen to twenty thousand spectra um, in the final data set. Now, when you I say the final data set, that's not the last excited. data set, is it, or just the the well, most the, recent data set? It's the last data set for this particular project. So their goal was to observe ten thousand galaxies with these fiber bundles, and they have now completed ten thousand galaxies for these fiber bundles. And that was the that was the aim for this generation survey. So I'm sure the Sloan telescopes will be doing other stuff after this, but I don't know what that is yet. Um, it could be like, let's go look at edge on galaxies. I don't right, know. <laughs> right. So I, you know, like I'm a gigantic fan of surveys and I, mm-hmm. I talk about this a lot that, that I'll take a survey over a dedicated telescope that you point at various things any day of the week, because it allows you to just kind of have an idea and then go back and look through the data like you did. Like, yeah. I wonder, and then you look at 2000 galaxies and, and make some answers. Yeah. Um, what do you think is the future of this of, of surveys? I mean, we've got Vera Rubin, which kind of pushes it into time based. Yeah, Vera Rubin, I think is a big step forward in that direction. Um, and I think at some point, we're going to end up with um, sort of large sky radio surveys, which we haven't had um so much before um but yeah the time domain astronomy is going to be the next big one i think where Mm -hmm. we push forward um so vera rubin will be really amazing i don't like i am really excited to see how they deal with that data volume because that (laughs) also sounds absurd yeah it's like Um, exabytes yeah it's it's like the entire internet every three days or something absurd. Right. Uh, <laughs> like, wouldn't, and, and so like compare like just apples, apples, like the telescopes that were, that were producing the Sloan digital sky survey are puny compared mm-hmm. to Vera Rubin, which is doing the whole thing every three nights. Yeah. Yeah. The Sloan digital sky survey is like a 1.2 meter telescope, right? So that's on par with Hubble um, ish. Well, I mean, Hubble's like 2.6. So that's like, yeah. Okay, so twice, Hubble's twice as large. Yeah, twice as, and Um, in space. And it's in space, which is cheating. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Right. But, but I mean, you uh, can buy a a meter class telescope for a few hundred thousand dollars and set up in your backyard and be an astronomer. (laughs) If you have a few hundred thousand dollars. If you have a few hundred thousand dollars to spare. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The point is, it's not, you know, a few billion like Vera Rubin. Yeah. Yeah. That's an eight point something Uh, meter telescope. Right. Yeah, having eight meter telescope class things do survey work is a brand new endeavor. Um, so yeah, I think that's going to be pretty impressive to have that. Um, I think honestly, Slo- the Sloan telescope is like the little little engine that could. It just keeps going. And if you have the ability to just let the sky scan over top of you, and you can just plonk things into fiber optic cables and be like, well. Um, we're either going to drift scan imaging or we're going to do spectra and we're just going to hang out on these galaxies until we get good spectra. There's a lot of power in just being like, yeah, we've got all the time in the world. So just like hang out. We're going to do a five year survey that's going to come up with as many of these things as we can find. Um, yeah, I'm I'm kind of envisioning like a space based survey like tests kind of mm. right that that is just scanning the entire sky at whatever resolution it can get away with um and then yeah producing it as a like a sloan digital sky survey but with much more depth yeah it's interesting with um space-based telescopes i think test is kind of the exception because it is this wide field imager um it's still, it's a wide field, but it's not all sky, right, Tess? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think with space-based missions, you tend to have either like a very fixed goal, like with Kepler and Tess, where we're just going to point at that bit of sky forever. Um, or you have things like Hubble and JWST and all of our other space-based missions, Chandra and um, these things, where you wind up with either a broad science case and you open it up to everybody and then people point the telescope and choose what they want to look at or you have a very narrow science case and then you do one thing Mm -hmm. so having a survey telescope in space is not really a thing we've done so far Mm 
Yeah. Um, aside from things like Euclid um, and the other CMB mappers. Yeah. Or uh, Gaia. Which really, yeah, or Gaia, where you really do have, but that's like, Gaia's one mission is like identify the locations of all the stars. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. It's just... still a very narrow science case where it's like, hey, let's just look at galaxies. Like, oh, that's a, a broader ask. Yeah. It would be really cool. I would love to have a Sloan in space. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll pitch it. We'll see what it, we'll see what happens. We'll pitch it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> see what yeah. Congress has to say about it. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so you've got, um, You've written a book, and you had you had actually written a book a couple of years ago, and yeah. we actually did an interview then and talked about your mm -hmm. book. Um, but you've got a new version of the book, and it's pretty I special. Do. So it's, why don't you show uh, people yes. what's what's been improved? Um, well, it has the benefit of being completely re-edited again. Um, so the original book I wrote it was a series of blog posts originally. And then uh, it turned into a book and I rewrote the whole thing. And then I got to the end of rewriting the whole thing and I went, that wasn't very good. And I rewrote it again and it was better. And so it has now been rewritten again. <laughs> so uh, it's gone back to a sort of Q&A format that the, the other version did not have. Um, there are new hypotheticals in it that mm -hmm. the previous edition didn't have. But the main thing that's new about it is that it is in full color. Yeah. Yeah. The it pictures were amazing. So pretty. Um, yeah. So almost all of these are um, public domain images that have been out from NASA or other things. But we also have some pretty cool, like, uh, bespoke illustrations Yep. Um, that were in collaboration with a, a graphic designer that worked on the book. Uh, some of these I had to sketch out first, um, just to make sure that everything was correct. i see if I can find one quickly. Um, yeah, here. Uh, stable orbits and unstable orbits. Um, these I had to sketch out and like, why doesn't thing, why doesn't a, uh, a globular cluster just collapse mm -hmm. onto itself? Yep. Uh, it's like, well, because they're all moving, all the Ooh. stars are moving. Yeah. So, if, but if you didn't have that, then you would sort of fall into the center. Um, yeah. And if you had no motion, you would just sort of plonk directly in. Um, so these were fun. It was, yeah, the big thing is that it is in spectacular color. Yeah. Like the whole thing is just gorgeous. The uh, So my experience in reading this version of it was I was like, oh, that had to be updated. That had to be updated. And and I think with the state of the science accelerating so quickly, you had to go through that book with a fine tooth comb and make sure yes. that every single thing that you said was was still true or mm -hmm. that something even more interesting hadn't been discovered that you would then have to acknowledge or else you'd look like an idiot for not talking about this thing. Yes. It, it did require, like, I genuinely rewrote almost the whole thing again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and certainly things like the, ex when you're talking about exoplanets, the, when the first book was written, the Kepler mission was still going. Um, and so at this point, I had to go back and say, like, okay, well, Kepler's finished, and now we have tests. Um, and Kepler found, final, finished, this many exoplanets, which were numbers we didn't have when we started it. Um, and things like the Vera Rubin telescope, like in the writing of the book was named, that telescope was named. Yes. So we originally had references to LSST and it's like, oh wait, no, that telescope has a new name now. Let's yep. go back and make sure that that's correct. Yep. Perseverance landed on Mars while yep. this was happening. <laughs> like Stuff was happening rapidly. Yeah. We were trying to keep up with like, okay. What, what next? Yeah. <laughs> what else is going on? And it's funny because it, I'm sure at a certain point it felt like a time saver. Like, oh, yeah, I've got all this material. Like, like I wonder, like, was turning your blog into a book and then into another book, was that in hindsight the right way to approach it? Or would it have been better to write kind of from first principles the material that – I guess would have been most relevant because because so much is changing and in flux and you had to go back and re-review it and and second guess every answer that you had given i think it would be a different book if i had written it from first principles yeah. and the, the the reason for that is because going from the blog to the book the blog itself is a q a yeah so 
I was getting questions from people like, Hey, I don't understand this. I don't, I don't get why this is. So yep. is this true? Does this work? What would happen if, and often they're questions that I, as a trained scientist would never have thought of. Right. So there are things like, Hey, I'm confused about these things. And you're sitting there going, Oh yeah, I guess that would be confusing. Uh, but you've slightly conflated two principles and that's why. And so then you ha can sit down and be like, okay, well, let's untangle those two thoughts. Yep. Um, and if I were to sit down and write like, okay, let's do introduction to astronomy, then it would probably be more of like, okay, here's the night sky. And then here's like the planets and yep. then here's, um, you know, stars. And instead like the distribution of material is, um, not what you would get out of a survey book where you're trying to do all of a sudden. Like I, I spend some time on Mars, a little bit of time on Jupiter, but we skip some planets. Yes. <laughs> nobody some asked concepts. any questions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There wasn't a lot on dark matter in the, in this book. No, there's not. Yeah. Um, and which is kind of interesting because it, dark matter is kind of in the public psyche as a thing, but, um, there was a question about like the shape of the universe, yep. which does not depend on dark matter and is a very different question. So you do get these complicated cosmological questions sometimes. Um, like, well, what does it mean when the, and the people say the universe is flat? It's like, yeah, it's because obviously you can go in every direction. It's like, yeah. Well, okay, okay so, so hold on. So stop. So this is funny because like, you know, QAs are kind of my bread and butter as well on, on my mm. channel. And so literally the video that I just posted, someone was going to be like, how do we know that the that the actual universe is bigger than the observable universe? Mm -hmm. and, and I gave an answer, but I would love to hear your answer. <laughs> How? I, I'm very curious what your answer was. <laughs> oh, that you. Know, I mean, I could give I could give yeah, mine at first if you prefer. Yeah, I'd love, yeah. Uh, let's let's hear yours and then I'll I'll let you know what I said. But, uh, but all right, how, so how do we know? The, the explanation. And how big do I, we think the actual universe is? Oh, uh, mathematically unfounded. Let's make it infinite. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, there's no. Yeah, I mean, there's no reason for it to be any particular size. And so if you continue the extrapolation that's that we normally make, then you can just keep going forever. And at that point, why not just call it infinite and call it a day? Right. Uh, it's big <laughs> so, or infinite. Yeah. And at some point, it's so big that it may as well be infinite. So does it make a difference if it's infinite? We're not going to see that portion right. of the universe anyways. So yeah. maybe it's fine. Um, so the, the explanation that I generally give for... Um, how we know that there is like the universe doesn't stop at the edge of the observable universe is that um, we can make the assumption that the earth is not in a particularly special place. Um, it seems to not be in a particularly special place in the galaxy. Uh, the galaxy does not seem to be in a particularly special place. And so our view of the universe should not be particularly special. Hmm. And then if we look in pretty much any direction, we say roughly an equal number of galaxies in every direction. And it doesn't look like there's any hint of them stopping or running out of galaxies. Um, and so if we then say, well, we aren't in a special place. So if we're not in a special place, then any other observer should see roughly the same thing. And since we can see galaxies in every direction, as far as the eye can see, and there's no hint of like, oh, there's fewer of them that way, specifically, um, then you can hopscotch your way to 12 galaxies over, mm -hmm. and they should see roughly the same thing. But if you keep hopscotching over, then at some point, you're so far away from us, that we would not observe them, because the amount of time to travel between those two, even at the speed of light, is too large. Right. And at that point, you have made a hopscotching universe that is the same from any perspective. And so you can keep going. Right. And then you have this principle of like, okay, well, the two cosmological principles, right? Uh, the universe is the same in all directions. Physics is the same in all directions. And we're not in a special location. Um, and so if we can armchair see a sort of uniform universe in every direction, then we 
either have to be in the exact center of it. Right. Or. Everybody not. sees this. And everybody sees yeah. roughly the same thing. That's interesting. That's a that is a that is a totally different approach than than what I I I just sort of <laughs> went at at astronomers figuring out the shape and curvature of the universe and using that as a way to to understand that the universe has to be at least bigger than we can see. Mm. You know the the ones like it's funny like clearly there and and I think you're exactly right that there are these two ideas that conflate together. People ask like well the universe is expanding why is andromeda coming towards us and Yeah, that's you know, a common one. A common one. Yeah, and you get all of these you get all of these questions, but there are some that that seem to be like people think of them a lot and mm -hmm. they are actually quite interesting and almost counterintuitive. So I'd love to know some, what are some of your favorite kinds of questions that you get? The ones that, that I, like, I don't know, maybe you've answered them all too many times. <laughs> I know I have. Um, but, but I wonder if there's ones that you just kind of go, that's so good. That's such a good question. I'll give I you, think a, that, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go, ahead. go for an example, but I have, I have a, like a slightly different answer to the question. Sure, no, uh, no, I want to, you're, you're I, the guest. I'm interviewing <laughs> you, so you give the answers. I, th I think the, the ones that are the most fun for me are the hypotheticals. Yeah. Because those are the ones where it's like, well, what if, or, you know, this doesn't work, but like what's, and it's usually an interesting play on concepts. Um, and so there's a good one that I don't think made it into this book, which is on how, if you were invincible, could you surf on the sun? And so there's a lot of ways to think about that, right? Yeah. Like, like, well, there are tsunamis. So it was prompted by this person seeing a video of um, like solar quakes where you get these waves and tsunamis on the sun, uh, which is cool. Uh, but then you have this immediate question of like, What's density of the sun at the surface at the like at the surface of the the top edge of the sun, and then you look this up and you're like, oh, it's really not very dense at all. Like our mental concept of right the photosphere of the sun is often like, oh, well, it's a ball of gas, so it's got to be pretty dense um, if it's going to prevent light from streaming freely. But actually, at the surface of the sun, it's not dense at all. And so if you put a surfboard on it, it would sink just on buoyancy principles. <laughs> like, yeah. um, so then I'm like three papers deep into some, like what's the density profile of the sun? Like trying to find the peer reviewed literature, like, okay, where's the density of the sun equal to the density of the human body? Um, just being like, I Google weird things. Um, <laughs> this law, you'll see weird ads for the next couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, I'm on a watch list somewhere. Yeah. Um, it's just odd stuff that I, it makes me go looking for data that I would not have otherwise thought to go look for. Yep. Uh, and so the, out of that particular question, I learned that the density of the sun becomes equal to the density of the human body about a third of the way in. Um, huh. That's so, surprisingly deep. It is surprisingly deep. Yeah. <laughs> so without a surfboard, you would uh, sink a third of the way in if you were inv invincible and weren't in immediately incinerated, which is what would actually happen. Uh, you could That would be where you would stop uh, from a buoyancy perspective. And, and so then if you want something to actually float on the sun, you can start asking, well, how light would it have to be? Or how big would your surfboard have to be? Right. Uh, and it's huge. And what would it have <laughs> like to be you, filled with? Uh, yeah, like it would have to be, if you wanted it to be a regular surfboard size, and like, yeah, how dense, how least, how undense would it have to be? But it's like, you can only float like the mass of a mosquito on the surface of the sun on a surfboard size. <laughs> uh, but so would the surfboard float? The surfboard would not float. Right. You would have to have the surfboard, the, the mass of a mosquito, and then right. it would float. Perfect. Right. Um, and if you wanted a human to balance on it, it'd have to be kilometers wide. It'd be like surfing Manhattan Island. So that's no longer any fun. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think those are the ones that are the most fun. There are definitely questions that get repeated a lot, but mm -hmm. I think the ones that I find most entertaining and most like, oh, huh, yeah, are definitely the ones where it's like, Okay, can you surf the sun? Like, what would happen to the Earth if we split the sun in half and made two half-sized suns? Like, 
Yeah, okay, I guess I'm looking up the luminosity function um, for how bright stars are as a function of mass. And what would happen? <laughs> uh, we would freeze. We, we would freeze, but what what would happen to the sun? Oh, so that was the that was the part that was elided in the question of like ignoring how you did that. Yes. Just replace the sun with two with a binary stars with a binary combined star mass system. of the sun. Yeah. Then, then what? Then I'm asking you. <laughs> <laughs> so then what happens is the the habitable zone becomes around where Mercury's orbit is, because wow. the the luminosity to mass function is very strongly dependent on mass and even having two stars producing the light um the net luminosity is way way less than one solar mass star so the yeah the the habitable zone turns into like mercury hmm. and that's assuming that the stars are orbiting closely enough that they're stable uh so we don't have any weird three body problems um but yeah the sum of two half solar stars is much less than the one solar mass yeah, star. Right. And, and two 50% mass suns would last much, much longer. Yes. It so it would. sounds like the perfect yeah. thing to do. Like we wanna, <laughs> if we want to live for much longer, we should put as a project to dismantle the sun into two equally sized stars. <laughs> Um, I think you might need that invincible surfboard to help you out at some point. <laughs> like slice the sun in half. Yeah. I've, I've, I've received that question as well, but but like people want to know if you could make red dwarfs. Mm. Right. And so you could make like 12 mm -hmm. and and then put them in some kind of stable um, multiple star system and have a whole oh, that's bunch That's tricky of... to do with 12. Yeah, yeah, you are going to need like binaries with binaries with binaries. Like it's it is definitely tricky and there's some certain yeah. distances. And I think the 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 advantage that you have over me is that you can do the math. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, it's a combination at this point of doing the math and also um kind of knowing where to look. Mm -hmm. Um and at this point, I have read enough papers that are not really in my field that I can make my way through them better than most, I think. Um, so it is a combination of practice and math. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's. I mean, it's, it's funny. There's, there's, there are some questions that I get that are wonderful. They're great questions, mm. but I wouldn't feel comfortable answering them without doing the math and i don't feel like my math is up to the to the level that it would be required mm. and if i you know if i if i have to you know i've got my degrees in computer science so i could mm -hmm. you know if you need it if you need some linear algebra done i can help you with that <laughs> if you need me to add two matrices together no problem but to you know to perform some of the more complex calculations especially if you start to shift into the the calculus and the uh, and so on mm -hmm. then it gets a little a little trickier but but i think that's where the nicest questions live is the ones that do require that no one is got, everyone has just gone oh that's I, I can't even think about that because there's too much math yeah. but if you actually do then you turns out the human body is buoyant at a th third of the way down in the sun and a surfboard yeah. the size of you know a city yeah et cetera. it's it these questions I think are super fun because I do have to sit down and do math for them. It's like, well, I don't know, and neither does anybody else, but I can have a guess. It's like, I'm not necessarily guaranteeing that I've done it completely, but I can tell you what assumptions I'm making. And mm. like under those assumptions, here's what comes out. Uh, so none of your questions have gotten picked up by nature yet? No, it turns out. Um, <laughs> Right. None of them have been picked up by nature. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What if I opened up my uh, spacecraft to space, which opened up the door? Mm -hmm. You did that. What would happen? You'd die. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> space is trying to kill you. But but if I... How... Space is super trying to kill you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, you know, in the uh, nitty gritty detail, you know, the, the, art, the one that you covered was on the moon, but I'm sure people would love to know. I'm... On the oh, moon. Yeah, that one, I open the door that, to my hab. What yes. next? Well, so it really depends. If, so with the moon, the fun thing about that particular problem was that the moon has no atmosphere. Um, and so the difference in pressure 
between one atmosphere of that we're used to on Earth and no atmosphere creates an absurd wind. Uh, so on Earth, wind is just, you know, it's a pressure differential. So you have high pressure in one place, you have low pressure in another place. Like you think about this with a balloon, you have high pressure inside the balloon, low pressure outside the balloon, you release the air, it makes squealing noises and it disappears out of the balloon. Right. You get a little tiny directable wind. So the problem with releasing your door onto like the moon or something like it is effectively you have let go of the end of your balloon. And so you have a tremendous wind flinging everything untied down uh, out. Um, so that particular question was actually originally prompted by the end of the game Portal 2. Um, okay. Where... Yep something very similar to this happens yes and they're just like well is that survivable and that was answering that question was the moment where i was just like i am on a government watch list now um because right. one of the things that i was trying to find was well if you're like hanging on to the door frame or something and something hits you how broken are you immediately mm -hmm. um and in general, the answer is yes, very. But I was then Googling things it's like, how much force is required in Newtons to break a human finger bone? It's just like, <laughs> oh no, <laughs> like this is not, Yeah. like I promise it's for writing, <laughs> the eternal writers thing of like, I'm not, I'm not a murderer. I yeah. promise. I'm writing for a book. <laughs> it's like right, right. Yeah. This one was like, this is for a blog post. I promise. <laughs> and so, um, so, and sorry. Yes. So, and so, what would happen then? You know, you you the wind blows you out to the door. You hang onto the door for a second. You're a box yeah, of like supplies. Yeah, like all of you dislocates. Yeah, it's real wax bad. into Every you. Everything flies out. It's basically, it's something like a 900 mile an hour wind, which is supersonic, um, which would just ruin most of you. Hmm. Um, so um, I, I did find a story of someone who ejected from a uh, fighter jet at above the speed of sound and survived, uh, but he was in an extremely bad way for about six months afterwards. Um, because he uh, broke many limbs and all of the capillaries in his face oh. broke. So his whole face swelled up, he said, to about the size of a basketball. And it was bad times. Uh, and so he was in recovery for six months. He was not out of the hospital right. for six months. So this would not do you any favors, even <laughs> if you were to immediately come back inside. Um, but then if you were flung out, you, assuming that you get to 900 miles an hour yourself and with the force of the wind, um, you still don't get to leave the moon, even if you're pointed up. Um, so you get to have sort of a 10 minute flight into the air until you hit the ground at 900 miles an hour, which I think will kill you. Right. Um, I didn't Google that one, but I'm pretty sure that will kill you. <laughs> right. Even on the moon. <laughs> even on the moon. Yeah. Um, there are things that are just you die. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's funny when you think about like, like jumping around on the moon, like, yeah, you, you could jump six times higher than you can on the moon. So if you can jump a meter on earth, you could jump six meters into the air. You could handle, you know, if you can jump down, say two meters and feel okay, you could jump down 12 meters and feel okay, but not more. And so it's yeah. not forever. <laughs> it doesn't keep going. Yeah. There's yeah. and hitting the ground, hitting ground, at 900 miles an hour, it doesn't really matter what the force of gravity is doing to you at that point. Yep. You are hitting at too much of an impact speed, and it will just... Yep. Uh, all right, so here's one that I get all the time, and right. and feel free, to, feel free to, to skip it. But what's inside a black hole? Mm. Is, it a, is it a... Like, inside the event horizon of the black hole, is it something solid, or is it not? And is there any way we could find out? Well, to the last part, uh, no, not really, because we can't go. Um, and if you do go, you can't come back. Um, so there's really no way of getting information out from the inside. Um, is, this is, again, one of these circumstances where simplifying assumptions uh, get thrown around because we don't really know, because we can't go. 
and math breaks. Right. Um, so physics breaks, math breaks. You have to divide by zero at some point, and then math goes, no, don't want it. Yeah, yeah, your and computer just goes, nopes on it, yeah. Well, we broke math, and uh, so we're kind of stuck. Um, so a lot of times you make the assumption that there is just like an infinitely dense point, because if gravity keeps going, that's what should happen. But then you're dividing, you get something infinitely dense because you have a bunch of mass in zero volume, divide by zero, break your computer. Um, but functionally, in terms of how the black hole influences the space around it, it doesn't really matter. Like if it is a solid object somehow, which would be weird, um, at the point where we can interact with it, we're outside the event horizon. So whatever's happening inside is never really going to be able to communicate with the outside. So if it's a solid, tiny, ridiculously nonsense object somehow, then it can just hang out and be a tiny, small, nonsense object. If it's going to be a singularity, which is the mathematical sort of end point of we've crushed all of the matter into nothingness. Right. Then, like, for outside the event horizon, that's the same difference to, to the rest of the universe. So um, we don't know. I think most physicists are quite happy to be like, yeah, inside the event horizon is just question marks. Um, like we've got we've got a gravitational description of what it's got to do, but at the very center, who knows? Um, and there are a lot of places in space where we're like, mm, yeah, at some point, it's just question marks. We don't know. <laughs> well, and so and that's where I was going to go next was just this idea of ambiguity as a mm. as a scientist that that you don't know, and you're fine with that. Yeah. How, this how... is this is a thing that happens a lot because I do a lot of Q and A's, um, or I have in pre-pandemic times. I did a lot of Q and A's right in the before uh, times. Yeah, yeah, in the before times, uh, where I just I just like fine. I'm just gonna show up. You guys ask me questions. That's I, I won't prepare anything. Mm -hmm. I will just answer questions until you're tired. <laughs> um, and, and they're usually super fun. And at usually at some point during the course of the event. There's a question where it's just like, I have no idea. <laughs> I have, yeah, no idea. I can make some guesses based on, based on other things I know. But yeah, don't know. I don't know if anybody knows that one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and it's, yeah, it's fine. It doesn't, it doesn't bother me to be like, oh, yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> and anyone who tells you that they do know is lying. Yeah, at some point. Like we genuinely don't know because yeah. like no one's done their PhD thesis on this yet. And we can't because we don't know the fundamentals to get, even get there. Mm -hmm. um, someone eventually will figure that out, but we just haven't built up our understanding to be able to answer these high level questions sometimes. Um, and it's, yeah, it's an interesting thing. I get this and so I teach Astro 100, which is astronomy for non-science majors. Mm -hmm. um, and I try and make it as open to questions as I can. But occasionally it means they ask me questions and I'm like, oh, I have no idea. And that's actually no longer astronomy. You need to talk to a biologist for that one. <laughs> right. That's their it's problem. Like, it's like, well, so the question I'm thinking of is someone asked you like, well, I said something about radiation sickness and how unpleasant it is. And so it's like, oh, well, would you like to just get cancer or, you know, some radiation sickness, you can just start throwing up forever. And that's not fun either. Um, I had a student like, why? Like, right. No idea why. Right. I can tell you that that's what happens. And I can tell you it's because of high energy radiation. After that, you got to go talk to a biologist right. because I have no idea why. Like, why? Being exposed to gamma ionizing radiation, radiation makes your body throw up. Right. <laughs> like, makes no you really idea. sick and makes all the sores form. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. Um, yeah, like allow me to introduce you to an evolutionary biologist who will tell you that they have no idea. <laughs> yeah. But they might have some better ideas. Right. Like well, they stories can... of like radiation yeah. sickness from like doing cancer treatments and other things. Right. It's like, why, why does that happen? Well, maybe we don't know, but they're going to not know at a yeah. different level that I'm going to not know. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm kind of imagining like, you know, if, if someone asks you a question about say abiogenesis, Right. And you're just like, you know, that's marginally a space question, but fine. 
And then, mm. but then if I went and took you to the most knowledgeable researcher who's worked in this field and spent their entire career, what they would give you is a very fancy, I don't know. So there's a definition of an expert that I heard somewhere and I have no idea where I got it from at this point, but um, the definition, and I keep coming back to it. And so the definition is an expert is someone who is confused on a very deep level. <laughs> <laughs> That's really like, good. Yeah. Yeah. Because like at some point you start asking me about galaxy questions and at some point I can give you a lot of answers. Yeah. And then we get far enough down into like what I'm actively researching and the things that I'm trying to understand now. I have no idea what's going on. That's why I'm doing the research. Um, but I have a lot of answers before then. But then at some fundamental deep level, no idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I think that's true of almost every field, right? Like you get to some point and you're like, oh yeah, we don't know how that works. <laughs> so how, how do you deal with that? I mean, I, again, I, you know, as, because I'm just a journalist, I get to sort of wash my hands of the whole thing and walk away and say, these are not my problems. Um, you know, don't ask me, I'm just a journalist, but, but there's like a lot of like derision, for example, like you, when I, we post stories about say dark matter mm -hmm. on, and on the YouTube channel and on the website and I get this on Twitter, like literally all the time, people kind of eye rolling going, duh, dark matter. Astronomers just made something up to whatever. Mm -hmm. And how do you deal with topics that you genuinely don't know the answer? You know, it's there, but you gen you genuinely don't know what the answer is. You have to live in this world of amb ambiguity and have to explain it to people. How do you approach that? Well, I can explain why we think something like dark matter must be there. Right. And mm -hmm. so there's a lot of pretty good reasons why something like dark matter must be there. Um, we have galaxy rotation curves, we have gravitational lensing, we have all of these pieces of evidence that point to there is something that has additional mass that we can't otherwise see. And then it's question marks, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and so generally in astro, in my introductory astronomy classes, we get to some point and NASA has these old uh, cartoons that they drew of um, dark matter cereal and dark energy cereal. There's contents, who knows? Uh, right. Like, if you figure it out, let us know. <laughs> it's like, I think there you have to have some level of just like, yeah, who knows? Yeah. And just... Um, like, I don't find not knowing everything unsatisfactory. Mm -hmm. Like, I like knowing things. But the fact that we don't know everything means that there's still interesting questions to ask and answer. Uh, yeah, but, but it feels to me like the perspective that I'm getting from this feels because you don't know everything, you don't know anything. Mm. Well, that's patently untrue. <laughs> this is a... This is a thing that you have to kind of deal with as a graduate student at some point, right? Like there's a point you en you enter graduate student stage and you get there and you're in your first year. And you're like, wow, I don't know anything. Um, and you go through your second year and it's just like, I still feel like I don't know anything. And you, it was, there's some turning point. And for me, it was around my third year. It was like, no, actually I do know some things. So the fact that I don't know what this person is talking about is not a reflection on me mm -hmm. because I know quite a bit of things. I just don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. And so for then to, for me to then start to ask questions like, hang on, I didn't understand that. Can you explain it again? Like, is this, or I'm not sure I understood, is this the correct interpretation? Um, it doesn't threaten the body of knowledge that I already have. Mm -hmm. It just makes it easier for me to understand what someone's trying to tell me. Right. Yeah. And so, I think there's an aspect of that with these kinds of questions as well. Like, well, I don't know everything, but I never promised to. Um, I promised to know quite a bit about space, but then past that, yeah. I made no further promises. <laughs> no, but even about the things about space, it's kind of like if you can't let the person hold some dark matter, then they think that you're a corporate shill for big telescope. It's an unusual, um, yeah, it's an unusual demand for evidence. And I don't think we apply that in all places equally, hmm. right? 
Um, I think it does happen with space related things a little bit more because it is so intangible in so many ways. Um, the most tangible piece of astronomy we have is the night sky and most people don't live in places where the night sky is accessible. And so we're losing that tangible piece of it as well. And certainly we can be like, well, here's a telescope, go look at it. We have mm -hmm. pictures of it. Um, but then at some point there is a, like, well, you have to trust that people are doing their best to understand things. Um, but I don't know that it's applied in the same way to absolutely everything, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there are obviously many parallels with the way that sort of um, public experts get treated, I think. And so I think public facing experts often get the same kind of thing. Um, public facing epidemiologists right now are getting a lot oh, of that. Yeah, um, yeah. Public facing climate scientists are getting get a lot of this uh, public facing. I think that like it's the the public facing scientist does face this challenge, I think, more than most. Um, but the average person, if you went to them and said, um, like, hey, we think it's going to snow a foot tomorrow. You're like, well, it's not snowing now. So show right. me the snow. It's like, yeah, but we're going to believe the meteorology and the fact that we can do weather forecasting. Um, and people have spent a lot of time and effort figuring out that, yes, indeed, it is going to snow a foot tomorrow. And maybe you should make your plans so that you don't try and drive somewhere when it is a foot of snow over ice. This is tomorrow's forecast. Yeah. <laughs> so I there are aspects of like, okay, well, it has a very tangible direct impact on your life where we do sort of take it for granted and like the weather forecast being one of them. Um, and things like, oh, you know, there's been a recall on food because there's salmonella or there's E. coli. We do sort of go, yeah, all right, we'll avoid that. Um, it's like, I don't need to be shown the E. coli. And I don't think most people need to be shown the E. coli. But right. um, I did, uh, I, that is really good, actually. I think you're exactly right. That you just give someone some tainted spinach and go, scientific experts say this is tainted with salmonella want some it's yeah i think right? it's it it becomes more difficult to to be convincing um to everybody so mm -hmm. not the general like the average person that you might run into in the street but to absolutely everybody it becomes much more difficult to be convincing to those to everybody the more abstract your science is yeah yeah um, um it is. I mean, I mean, I think the answer for me is this is not for you. Right. And so I think part of the approach is, well, yeah, this like I'm not trying to convince absolutely everybody. Yeah. I'm trying to talk to people who are interested in learning more. Um, yeah. And so for in for my case, like the blog is for people who are interested in writing in. It's like, well, if you're interested enough to write in and ask me a question in good faith, then I'm perfectly happy to answer that question in equal good faith yep. without making fun of the question or talking down to the person who did the asking. It's like, well, you asked me the question. Here's the best answer I can write back. Um, but it's not for everybody. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's it. Like if, like if you want a group of people who will be skeptical of experts and, and expect all knowledge before any knowledge, then there are places you can go and 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 hang out with your friends and, yeah. and share and your there ideas. There will be plenty of those people for, yeah. on yeah. on any particular ha, topic. Take, yeah, you can have your fill of that. Mm -hmm. But for the people who are curious and and are okay with with uh, question marks, then yeah. then have we got what you need? Um, <laughs> we got science for you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, we've only got five minutes left, so so. I got one other question that you didn't talk about very much, but you talked about hmm. it a bit is, uh, are we alone? What do you think? What is, what is your answer to the Fermi paradox? My answer is that space is very large. Um, and that in general, I think people underestimate how large space is. 
and how introversible these mm. distances are. So it seems to me very statistically unlikely that we are the only intelligent species capable of designing, building, making rockets, radio telescopes, anything else you like that has ever occurred in the entire universe. That seems like going back to like the earth is special. Right. And I think the earth is unlikely, but I don't think it's impossible. And with all of the other stars and all of the other planets and however many galaxies you want to count, it seems plausible to me that other species have developed and and grown over the years in their own little bubble of of the cosmos but they're gonna be really far away yeah the the introversible part is the one that makes me sad yeah because it because it does feel because it because if it was easy they'd be everywhere and the fact that they're not everywhere means it's not easy well it's not easy and it's big yeah right like even if it were relatively speaking easy to go from your star to the next one over um that's still far right alpha centauri proxima centauri is four light years away yeah and we're not going to ever be able to make a spacecraft go at the speed of light yeah and so that means you're traveling for generations just to get to the next star over which in our case is not great for life um that Proxima Centauri and Alpha Centauri have like nasty solar flares. Not a great place to hang out. So maybe you can't go to the first star. You've got to go to the third one. And then you're looking at distances of 20 light years. Well, that's going to take four times, five times as long to get there. And so if every star takes you a generation, just because of the physical limitations of accelerating a spacecraft to any speed with any mass, it's it's not going to be easy in terms of time, even if it were easy technologically, which we have not found to be the case. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, I mean, but I... The, even even to message is. <laughs> yeah, I it's and, and that's the part it's that makes me the saddest is like even if <laughs> if we're not alone then it is so difficult to both travel and communicate that we might as well be alone. This is, and this is basically where I sit of like, yeah. I assume that somewhere out there, some form of life has developed that is interesting and that we could recognize as life if we were to see it, but we will not. And we will not even hear from these other yeah. worlds ever. Because it just is too far away. Yeah. Like and even our local part of the galaxy is too far away. So. And if we're going to figure out a way to make it to trivialize it, then they would have as well. And they didn't. Therefore, we won't like like no matter how you slice this, it feels it feels uh, like a big I mean, ask. It, it always comes down to the fact that the speed of light is the speed limit. Right. Right which is a physical limitation of the entire universe. So, and trying to get yourself moving to any substantial fraction of the speed of light takes so much energy that yeah. you can't. And yeah. that is also just a physical limitation of the universe. So. Yeah, but, yeah. unfortunately the universe isn't what we wanted it to be in some cases. The universe is, is what it is. These are the rules. The book is astroquizzical. Um, yes. Hold up one more time. Uh, congratulations on, and I'm really Thank glad you. that you guys went ahead and went through that whole process of doing a new version with the pictures because the words are great, but the pictures really kind of take it to the next level and all the infographics and stuff to help this understand is, it. So. This is what it feels like this book should have been. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm really pleased with it. Congratulations. It, it is out yesterday. So. <laughs> if, good timing. If people want to find out more, uh, where should they go? Um, so it is available pretty much anywhere books are sold. Um, if you would like to get a copy with my signature on it, my very local bookstore is doing that for me. Um, so Mind Fair Books in Oberlin will be the place to get in touch with. Okay. But um, if you're just after a copy that is shiny and new, then um, 
yeah, anywhere you can find books will should be there. And if people want to follow your work, maybe even ask a question for the blog, where should they go? The, the blog is astroquizzical.com. And so you can submit questions there. Uh, I am on Twitter and uh, as Jillian underscore Scudder and in several other places. My website is jillianscudder.com. Awesome. Um, and you can find all my links to various places there. Well, Dr. Scudder, great to talk to you again. Uh, hopefully we'll, you'll write another book and we'll have another update. Uh, I will write another book. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> you heard it here. So a future interview is inevitable. All right. Well, thank all you so right. much. Take the time to chat today and, and good luck with the book. Thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations. Thank you.